Yeah. We are still in Micah. <laughs> Just this year. Yeah. All right. We should be live. Oh, Mary. Welcome. We are Micah, and we did not finish. We are working on three, so we're actually not okay. quite to chapter four yet, but we need to finish up three yet. Uh, and uh, we're going to look at beginning Micah 3, 5 through 8 uh, is where we're going to start. Uh, this is the section, remember chapter 3 is divided into three parts. The first part is addressed to the rulers, the second part is addressed to prophets, priests, mm -hmm. pastors, and the third part is addressed to everybody. Okay, And so uh, v verses 5 through uh, 8 are the ones addressed to prophets, priests, pastors. Thus says uh, the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray, who cry peace when they have something to eat, but declare war against them who puts nothing in their mouths. Therefore it shall be night to you without vision and darkness to you without divination. The sun shall go down on the prophets and the day shall be black over them. The seers shall be disgraced and the diviners put to shame. They shall all cover their lips for there is no answer from God. But as for me, I am filled with power, with the spirit of the Lord, and, the just, and with justice and might, to declare to Jacob his transgression, and to Israel his sin. Uh, let's see, I've got a question here. Are you streaming tonight? I haven't got notification if I want to join. Yes, yes, we are live. Um, so... Uh, the, we talked a little bit a lot about it, you know, last week about how the uh, um, verses, uh, th we're in chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. Uh, we talked a little bit about how uh, the part about, you know, when, you got, when you're getting fed, then you say one thing, but when you're not, you say another. You know, about uh, pastors uh, who, are, who uh, adjust their message according to what they're getting out of it. Uh, and, you know, I mean, obviously the, our favorite whipping boy is, is someone like Joel Olstein or someone like that who does a, a, a name it and claim it kind of theology. I've talked a lot of times about that movie, The Eyes of Tammy Faye, mm -hmm. uh, fantastic movie uh, if you want to really understand the inside uh, of televangelism and how that, how that worked. And, and understand a little bit about how because they were caught up in uh, this uh, kind of wealth theology... Um, weird didn't get the notification. Oh, okay, but you're on. All right. Uh, because they did, they uh, didn't. They they kind of believe this wealth kind of mentality. This this uh, uh, they were so into that that you know you, in the movie you know it, sh it talks about how he could justify buying a fancy car and not making payments because God would provide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, because he was doing God's will, mm -hmm. and so. Uh, it's very um, tempting mm -hmm. uh, when you are trying, you know, whether we agree with all of his decisions or all of his thoughts or not. I believe that they were trying to live what they believed was a godly life and trying to do what they thought he wanted them to do. Uh, and it's very tempting uh, to think, well, then I should get rewarded for that. Mm. You know, I should get, I should have mm -hmm. all everything I want. I should be have, you know, all kinds of riches poured out upon me and earthly fame and, and fortune and all that. But that's not how God works. Wasn't that pastor this summer that had all the gold and somebody came in while he was preaching? A black pastor. Yeah, I don't know. And when I was on sabbatical? It was, it was just this summer. You talking about here? No, not no. here. Oh. I don't even know where it was, but he was preaching and he all, had all this gold and diamonds oh, yeah. and the big chains and... And people came, and some guys came in and robbed him in the middle of the <laughs> service. And because he had all this, he, he doesn't see anything wrong with having all that. Well, I don't. You know, again, it's money. I wouldn't say necessarily there's anything wrong with it. Uh, you know, I have a, a, a friend who is very a, a pastor who's very very wealthy uh, because he inherited everything. He's he's a, he inherited a family fortune. Uh, he happens to be the type of person who you would never know. I mean, he wears you know thrift clothes, thrift store clothes, and drives a you know twenty year old car because that's just how he is. But and he doesn't like fancy stuff. Um, 
he likes to be very frugal. You know, he, frugality is a sport for him. Uh, <laughs> But the point is, is that if he did decide, well, I'm going to drive a Bentley and wear, you know, silk and and whatever fancy clothes are and gold and all that, there's nothing, nothing wrong with that inherently. Uh, but the idea that because I'm doing God's will, I deserve this and God will provide all this because I'm doing his will, that is not promised. Nowhere in scripture does God promise that you will have physical rewards for doing his will. Okay. He says you will be rewarded, and you'll be rewarded 30, 60, even 100 fold, but not necessarily monetarily or physically. It may be spiritual rewards, you know, and, and, and maybe you can see some of that in your own lives, that where you've had mm -hmm. phenomenal rewards that were not necessarily monetary. And sometimes we've had monetary rewards. I mean, so I was just telling uh, somebody uh, today about uh, when, I w when we were on Vicarage, and uh, Danya had left a job uh, in St. Louis where she was making, you know, decent money. It wasn't fabulous, but it was decent money. And we went to Vicarage and I made half of what she was making. She didn't have a job. The car broke down. She got sick. I mean, everything that could go wrong did go wrong, you know. It was, and I mean, I was thinking, we're going to be bankrupt by the end of the month, you know, our first, our first uh, month of Vicarage. And my home church sent us $1,000. Well, so a thousand dollar check showed up in the mail, and you know, not all churches support their vicars. We do. We support Jackson, but not all not all churches support their vicars when they're on vicarage because they figure, well, you're you're out making money, you don't need support, but you don't make much money. <laughs> <laughs> Jackson gets paid mm -hmm. while he's doing. Yeah, so yeah, you get much, you get paid something. something. Yeah, you get something paid something. It's not, and it, it's you know, it's. Uh, it's a pretty, it's a pittance, yeah. you know. I don't know what it is these days. In, in my day, it was 550 a month, I think, mm -hmm. and housing. Okay. You got 550 a month and, and, a, and an apartment. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what it is today, but uh, but, but the, the big thing for us was we had to buy uh, health care, health insurance, because health insurance is not covered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we were paying, and even now I look back at it and I laugh because it was $85 a month. Mm -hmm. But you know, when you're making five fifty, eighty five is a fifth of your yeah. <laughs> fifth of your check. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I mean it's kind of funny today when you think about what health insurance costs today and eighty five dollars was just astronomical back for us. But yeah, that's the way it always is. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, you look back and Yeah, exactly. Um like my grandfather my I, I have the somewhere I have the uh voters meeting, uh where they raised my grandfather's salary in nineteen sixty 60, 59, 58 or 59, it was 60, somewhere in there, early, late 50s, early 60s, they raised his salary to 8,000 something a month, I mean, a, a year. And, uh, and you know, honestly, they lived pretty well. Mm -hmm. So that must have been, 8,000 a year must have been okay back then mm -hmm. because uh, they they had a pretty nice life. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he served a big church, so... I, I, yeah, I was slow, but I was thinking, that's funny. I look at that church budget, but the interesting thing about it is that the whole budget of that church was around thirty thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and his mm -hmm. salary was around a third, which is the way it usually works out. Yeah. His salaries are generally around a third of the budget, mm -hmm. you know, for most churches. Always have been. Um, pastors uh, uh, is, is talking about Mike again. That last verse of Mike is, a, but I am for me. As for me, I am filled with power, with the spirit of the Lord, with justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Uh, pastors are sometimes called arrogant or worse uh, when they have the audacity to tell sinners that they are wrong. Or the fortitude to move forward with, with God's will, despite what prevailing wisdom may be. Um, so we see that today. And we saw that with Micah. That shouldn't surprise us. That people don't like being told they're sinning, mm -hmm. you know, and when they're especially when they're invested in it, you know, it's one thing if you go out and you you, you commit an error of judgment. It's another thing when you're this is your this is your plan. <laughs> you know, this is this is what we're doing here. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, uh, my pastor uh, refused to allow the congregation to participate with the Methodists and the Baptists in a community Thanksgiving worship service. And I can vividly remember that one of the uh, one of the elders of that time 
telling the pastor he has no right to tell the congregation with whom they can worship. And my pastor uh, said to him, if you no longer wish to place yourself under my authority, then there's the door and you should use it. And he did. And he took his offerings with him and it was no small thing. And I can remember because my dad happened to be on the board of elders at that time. And so I got to hear the inner, the inner circle intrigue. Uh, my, our pastor took a lot of heat for that because it was, a, it was not a small thing uh, to lose that family and to lose those offerings. But he stood fir firmly and said, no, we don't celebrate worship with Baptists and Methodists. Because that was all the rage. I don't know if, if it was around here or not, but in the 80s, um, it was the rage to have joint worship services. And especially in small towns, all the churches would get together for Thanksgiving and have a big worship service for Thanksgiving. And we were all supposed to pretend like we didn't, there weren't any differences. Yeah, you know, we all hold hands and sing Kumbaya. Yeah. You know. But... And, every, and, and for the most part, people loved it mm -hmm. because it was really fun. You know, you get together with your neighbors and all your friends and the people you're on school committees with and PTA and uh, people you see at the country club and all that. And everybody, of course, back then, especially in a small southern town, everybody went to church. Mm -hmm. And so you go down to the big Baptist church, for which just was Central Baptist, that could seat, you know, 5,000 people. And everybody comes there for Thanksgiving worship, and you got the Lutherans and the Catholics and the, the Methodists and the Presbyterians, and we're all having worship together. And my pastor felt that was not, he, he, what he said was, uh, we're, not telling, we're not being truthful. You know, we don't agree with these, what these people believe about many things. And to, to sit and to worship with them is to lie to them. That's what the way he explained it to the board of elders is that we're not going to lie. We're you know this is the tr the truth is we don't agree with them. They're you know the ones who are non sacramental we don't agree. The ones who are papists we don't agree. You know we're not going to pretend like we do for the sake of a uh, what he called Thanksgiving, which I have adopted in my life a hallmark holiday. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I'm not surprised the Roman Catholics came. Not many of them did. They were invited. The priests didn't participate. At it. I'm sure they didn't. But some of the, you know, I mean, the Roman Catholics who, uh, you know, were were there for good business. You know, the the guy who owned the the used car lot, and you know, same reason they all belong to uh, the Elks Lodge and uh, the Masons and all that kind of stuff. Was, <coughs> I, I I mean, like today. I don't know if there are any Masons who really believe in the religious aspects of the Masonic Lodge. But I, no. I would be shocked to find one, because you can't even find one who believes in the religious aspects, aspects of the church. <laughs> you know? no. So I would be shocked to find a Mason who really believes that they do it for business. You know? yeah. But in those days, I think it was, more, it was more common to find the religious aspect of it, too. Uh, verse 9. <coughs> Excuse me. Hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, who detest justice and make crooked all that is straight, who build Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. Its heads give judgment for a bribe, its priests teach for a price, its prophets practice divination for money. Yet they lean on the Lord, Yahweh, and say, Is not Yahweh in the midst of us? No disaster shall come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field, Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins, and the mountain of the house a wooded height. Okay, so now Micah lumps all the, the leaders and the priests together. Um, archaeological evidence, by the way, uh, if you look at some of the archaeology from Micah's day, is that uh, things were going really, really well. They were doing a lot of building. Uh, there, was a, there was a lot of affluence, a lot of good stuff happening in Jerusalem and in, in Judah. Uh, last week I heard, uh, well, probably a week and a half ago now, I heard uh, President Biden on TV uh, talking about how great everything is right now mm -hmm. and how we have to protect our democracy, yes. um, that uh, uh, everything is going fantastic and we need to go to the polls to protect our democracy. And, keep, you know, and I, wow. the, the implication was vote Democrat because mm -hmm. that's why everything's going so great. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to ask him, but I couldn't, 
because he won't take my calls, is when you live when you live in a nation that that promotes the wholesale murder of unborn children, you have double digit inflation and unsecured borders. Yes. Mm -hmm. What is going great? And crime right? all over the streets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nothing's going great. You know, great. and yet Micah lived at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, the rulers of Micah's day would have said, things are fantastic. Mm -hmm. Everything's great. Now, what they really mean, if, if you need to translate that, hold on a second, let's see. <laughs> oh, this is funny. Excuse me just a second. Uh, let's see. I'll tell you. The, I'll tell you the story in just a second here. If I, I can. Say, can you share? <laughs> yeah, there's a story. Okay. If Donnie answers, there's a story. Yes, um, uh, Sarah texted me and told me that Zeke is tearing the package up in the front yard. Please get it. Thanks. <laughs> she, Sarah has you know the ring notification yeah. that tells us when because she likes to to look at it when Zeke and the dogs are outside, <laughs> and she talks to Zeke on the door and all that oh kind God. of thing. You know? And so she must have heard the the and so she looked at it and Zeke's out there ripping a package apart. <laughs> so she said, "If Donnie's at home, tell her to go outside and rescue the package." <laughs> <laughs> oh, Zeke. <laughs> Zeke's on a roll. <laughs> he literally he literally just opened it up and as you called, hope the package survived. <laughs> yeah, he's a monster. Uh, he was so excited this morning with the snow. He got up and he looked out the window and saw the snow and that was it. Yeah. I had to get up, and we had to go for a walk right now. Oh, yeah. He was jumping over the couch. He was up and down off the bed. I mean, it was snow. We had to go. Yeah, yeah. He loves the snow. Anyway, back to this. Uh, this is of you know. Is it, you know, this is what Micah was experiencing. Is the rulers are rich, the priests are rich, people are doling out money left and right. That's what they mean by things are going great. Yeah. Our pockets are getting lined. Mm -hmm. Do they care about the people who are suffering? No. No, I mean, you know, too bad, sorry. Uh, you know, do they care about the, uh, as you know, they talk about the uh, um, using the sweepings on the scale, you know, you'll, you'll see that in the, in the Old Testament where they talk about the sweepings or the leavings. What they're talking about is what they would do is they would, when they'd measure grain out, they'd sweep up the dirt and put it on the scale to, to oh, add a little bit more weight. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, yeah, you wouldn't just get grain, you'd get all the dirt too, yeah. you know. Uh, like things the like that. Yeah, the old butcher putting his thumb on the scale. Same thing yeah. is going on. Yeah. yeah. Um, when, and and the, 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 the reason for this then and the reason for this now is that leaders who are, uh, who, who are leading under conditions like this are pursuing a different goal than we are. So if you're pursuing the goal of power and wealth, then you're, they're doing it right. Okay, because if you'll notice, they're all getting more and more powerful and more and more wealthy. You know, they're doing it right. You know, you can't you can't fault them uh, for being uh, stupid. You know, they know what they're doing. Yeah. Now, who's tearing up the package in your yard now? Not <laughs> Zeke. Uh, yeah, Zeke's in live. Leave Zeke out of it. He's in our he's in our house. Um. So yeah. So they're they're doing it right, but. The, the, the frustration is, is that our goal is faithfulness to God, see? And when, you're, when your goal is faithfulness to God, that's going to put a whole different set of, of, uh, of things on the table. You know, you got different criteria if, you're, if you're, your goal is faithfulness to God. It's sort of like have, trying to have an argument uh, with a Roman Catholic. You, you, when, when they have... Uh, the Bible and church tradition, and all we have is the Bible. So w most of our arguments die out there because as soon as they go to church tradition, we'll say, well, we don't subscribe to that. Well, you know, now we're, our argument's dead because that's, that is, to them, for them, is just as important as the Bible, you know. 
uh, Greek Orthodox, you know, uh, the Bible and church history, you know, the fathers, the Nicene fathers. Well, okay, but once again, you know, we, ours dies out with the Bible. Uh, ELCA, uh, well, the Bible, but only insofar as it's the Word of God. Oh, okay, yes, we agree with the Bible insofar as it's the Word of God. Who decides what's not the Word of God? Well, we do. You know, <laughs> we have meetings and we decide what's the Word of God and what's not the Word of God. And we, you know, well, no, we can't do that because, you know, uh, just, just like uh, today in staff meeting, we were just talking about that and someone brought up uh, the argument of, uh, well, yeah, but the Bible has had many revisions and many reinterpretations. And not everybody interprets it the same way. And that, that was the argument that somebody on staff got. And I said, that's fine. I said, I, that's, that's a valid argument. Come talk to me. We'll, we'll look at the Hebrew and the Greek. Mm -hmm. Okay? And, and so the, that's, that's a valid argument to say some Bibles uh, may not get it right. Yeah, if you're reading the... Uh, the Living Bible. The, well, the Living Bible is a paraphrase. Yeah. Or I was thinking of uh, the Book of Mormon. You know, or uh, what's the New World Translation? That's the Jehovah's Witness. Yeah, there's things they don't get right because they they uh, adjust it to you know to get to their own theology. Oh, yeah. But the ESV is directly from the Hebrew and the Greek. That's why it's a little bit unreadable sometimes. Sometimes it's a little bit hard to read because when you go from an Eastern language to a Western language, translation's not easy. Uh, and then when you go for, even when you go from Greek, which is a Western language, into English, sometimes translation's not easy. You know, it's not, if you've ever translated a foreign language, you know that it doesn't always match just perfectly with English. You know, because, well, English doesn't match perfectly with anything. But, um, well, just think of the Bible translators who have to yeah. translate from all the different languages in Africa and elsewhere. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's not easy. It's, and you're not going to you're not going to get it perfect every time. And there's going to be argumentation about well, was is this what's intended or is that what's intended? But none of the main translations have any fundamental arguments on the Word of God. I mean, there's little little stuff that doesn't matter. Well, did was this a? a I can't even think of anything right offhand, but there, there's, you know, was it iron or, or was it metal? Oh, no, I know what it was. Here's a good one. Uh, the word that Hosea uses uh, for some kind of bird uh, is translated as eagle. Well, do they really have eagles in the Middle East? Probably it was something else. It was probably a type of vulture that they have that he's talking about, but it was a great big bird, you know? <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter theologically. It doesn't affect your salvation whether it was an eagle or a vulture. You know, that's the kind of those are the kind of discrepancies we have in the scriptures, and we'll never know for sure because the word that he uses is not used very very many other places, and so you're just going to have to guess at what he was talking about, other than it was some kind of big bird, and it was probably a meat eating bird from the way he was using it in his you know in his discussion. So, you know, there's a, there, those are examples of things that, yeah, there are honest to goodness, um, you know, discrepancies over what does the Hebrew actually say. Well, we don't actually know because there's not enough uh, cross-reference, you know, to, to be able to tell. Most everything uh, in the Hebrew Bible uh, can be interpreted by the rest of the Hebrew Bible. You know, you look at it, you know, how is it used here? Well, how is it used there? And then you put it together with how it's used there, and then you get a, a real clear image of, of what it means. So it's really not nearly as mysterious as people who don't want to follow God's word make it want to seem. You know, they want it to be, well, that's all just human interpretation. Yeah. No, it's pretty clear. I mean, there's things that God is just really clear about. Uh, and he's not, he doesn't mince words, and there's never any, any misunderstanding. Uh, and the bottom line is, if you don't want to believe it, and that's where we are with the ELCA, is that they don't want to believe uh, the things that they don't want to believe. So I don't know where we can go from there. You, we believe that it's the divine and inerrant word of God. You believe it's interpreted by human beings as to what's correct and what's not. In a discussion, I think. Uh, I don't think I can talk about much more other than until we until we one of the other of us comes to a different conclusion. 
about whether this is the Word of God or not. Um, we have to ask ourselves, uh, what is the goal being pursued here? Okay, that's, that's in, in everything we do as Christians, what is the goal being pursued here? The answer is always faithfulness to God. If it's not faithfulness to God, we're pursuing an unworthy goal. Okay? If it doesn't tie back into faithfulness to God somehow, then we're pursuing an unworthy goal. And we probably shouldn't be wasting our time pursuing it. Uh, it might be financially expedient, but it would be a, still a big waste of time if it's not faithfulness to God. It might, it might gain us other things in other ways. But if it's unfaithful to God, it's wrong. And that's really what people don't like to hear. That business of wrong. They hate that word. You're wrong. Who are you to say I'm wrong? Exactly. I'm nobody. I'm nobody to say you're wrong. i absolutely nobody. I happen to work for somebody <laughs> who says you're wrong. And I'm just telling you what he says. You know, that's I, anytime people complain about the sermon, I say, look, I don't like it either. <laughs> Talk to my boss, because he's the one who keeps on saying stuff. Yeah, I would much, it would be much more pleasant to get up and preach about unicorns and puppies and clouds and how nice everything is and let's all hold hands and it's just wonderful and that would be much nicer. Okay, much nicer. Or I could just do, you know, do a comedy routine and uh, get up and you know, talk about com you know, comedic things and, or current events or uh, you know, like in the Middle Ages, uh, there, there were lots of sermons on planting cycles and you know, helpful things that you know, when, when the best time to plant this is and w what the best problem for root rot is or best solution for root rot. And, you know, those are the kinds of sermons that were being preached. You know, Luther went out and said, well, what does this have to do about Jesus? <laughs> You know, and the and the and the they have, they weren't taught anything, other than when you you know people want to hear something helpful. Mm -hmm. okay, so we'll give them what they want to hear. Mm -hmm. You give them what they want to hear, then they'll give money. If they give money, Rome's happy. There you go. You know, everything's everything's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing today. Yep. Same thing today. Pastor, do you have to keep bringing up those topics? Which topics? You know, the ones that tick people off. <laughs> you mean sin. <laughs> yeah, because sin ticks people off. No one likes to be told they're sinning. Mm -mm. Yeah. And, and I agree. I don't like it either. Talk to my boss. Mm -hmm. He's the one who keeps bringing it up. Look at the texts. That's why I'm a textual preacher. Okay? Because I don't want to be accused of you know, choosing my favorite topics. I only have three to choose from. Right. And then we go round and round, uh, three a month. Right? Yeah, so the same three every month. Okay. Yeah. Why well, we should do the fourth Sunday? Okay. No, I mean I only have every Sunday. I have three to choose from. Oh. Okay. Old Testament, Epistle, and Gospel. Yeah. I have three to choose from. Oh, I see. What yeah, you mean. I can't possibly. I you meant you had three of your favorite. Oh no. Other, uh, oh no, I don't have that. Ones. No, I don't have that many. <laughs> <laughs> if I was going to do my soapbox, it'd probably be about two. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, okay. No, I mean I have three yeah. texts to right. choose from. Right. I got. I mean, you know, you can't find a soapbox every every week. You right. gotta. You get. You know, you're forced so, to. Yeah. If you're a textual preacher, yeah. you're forced to move around. Okay. And find. And there, occasionally, I will get so tired of the appointed texts. There, you know, I'll hit a Sunday where I have preached on that topic, uh -huh. on that text, you know, th twenty times, and then that's when you'll see me pick from someplace weird, like preach on a hymn. Or pit, preach on the appointed psalm for the day, or something like that, because I just can't deal with the text anymore. Thanksgiving is one of those. I, I was just yeah. going to say the ten lepers. Holy mackerel! Yes. The same yeah. three texts yeah. year after yeah. year after year after year. It's it, I don't remember what I, I don't I can't remember what I'm preaching on this year. I haven't looked at that yet. Mm -hmm. um, I've written it. I just don't remember it. Yeah, because I mean, you just get so tired, and then the ten lepers comes up twice during the year. Yeah. So yeah, you know, not know, Thanksgiving. Yeah, really yeah one other time. Yeah. 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 And so yeah, it's, come on, and it's you know, how many times can I preach on this? Yeah. Um. So that's. 
And give it a different flair. Yeah, <laughs> that's what. That's what. You know, it's not hard. It's people will say, "How do you come up with something new to preach every week?" It's not hard because there is nothing new to preach. Yeah. What's hard is to is to figure out how to preach the same old thing yeah. in another way. Right. This is the same because there's only one message: mm -hmm. Christ and cruci Him crucified. That's it. It's got to be preached every week. Um, you know, and that the worst, the worst. Uh, criticism a preacher can hear is I didn't hear about Jesus you know I, I didn't hear about Jesus I this was really an interesting history lesson uh, this was a interesting cultural lesson uh, blah 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 but if I had known who Jesus was when I walked in here I wouldn't know now that's a horrible criticism yeah, yeah it can, all of us can fall into it mm -hmm. yeah, but but it's it's terrible you know but even when you you preach, you you were talking about the windows and what they represented mm -hmm. a few years, probably more than a few years now. You still managed to get Jesus in there. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it all had to do with him. But yep, I work at it. I try yeah. to I try to get Jesus and him crucified in every sermon. <laughs> yep, yep. There's there's several things that that you, you a, a good preacher works at. Uh, one is to get Christ crucified in every sermon. Another is to get the sacraments in every sermon. Mm -hmm. Because those are the that, those are the means. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't do us any good to know the to know what the goal is if we have no way to get there. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're if we're standing uh, in Chicago and looking across the lake at St. Joe's and saying, "Well, that's where we have to go," but we have no idea how to get there. Mm -hmm. We don't have a boat. We don't have a car. Uh, we don't have any way to get there. So the means, the gospel, uh, the word, and the sacraments. That's the means to get us to where we're going. You know the old the old uh, model. Uh, it was goal malady means. Every sermon was supposed to be goal malady means. The goal is where you want the people to be. The malady is what's keeping them from getting there, and the means is is how you get them there. So, like if uh, you're looking at the ten lepers, you know what's the goal? The goal is for us to be faithful in giving our thanks to God. You know the the malady is we get distracted. Uh, we we get uh, you know, pulled away from God. We get absorbed by our own issues, or absorbed uh, with ourselves somehow. And the means is word and sacrament. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's always the means is God's that's word right. and sacrament empowering us to be who He wants us to be. Yeah, it's not, and it's, the means is never well. Dig deep, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Mm -hmm. Can't do that. Doesn't work. The means always has to be. From God, you know God's word, God's sacraments. All right, looking at Micah four, uh, Micah four one through five. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountains, uh, that the mountain of the house of the Lord, the house of Yahweh, shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and it shall be lifted up above the hills, and peoples shall flow to it, and many nations shall come and say. Come, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples, and shall decide disputes for strong nations far away, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, Neither shall they learn war any more, but they shall uh, sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord, Yahweh of hosts, has spoken. For all the people, uh, Yahweh Sabaoth, that's Lord of hosts there, Yahweh Sabaoth, mm -hmm. has spoken. For all the peoples walk each in the name of its God, and we will walk in the name of, the Yahweh, uh, of Yahweh our God. Forever and ever. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that's Yahweh Elohim. Yahweh our God. Yahweh Elohim. Uh, Micah proclaims here what he's proclaiming, and you've heard me talk about it many times, is the great reversal. Uh, when people will hunger for God's word and desire to live according to it instead of arguing about and questioning what God says. Um, Sounds completely unfamiliar. I have no idea what he's talking about. We don't experience anything like that here ourselves. Uh, 
all we see today is people questioning what God says. Uh, que- and, and not only questioning what God says, but questioning if it's even if any if God is even valid. Mm-hmm. Do we even need God? Uh, we we see this um, we see this in uh, oh practically everyone under fifty uh, at least uh, is this whole concept of uh, I'm not sure God was really all that useful. Uh, and we don't really need it. I've done fine without God. You guys, you've got all these people who've been, they've been raised without going to church. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, they've done fine. Mm-hmm. So, you know, my mother and my grandmother, they, they went to church all the time. And, and uh, I don't see them any better for it. I got to, you know, I don't, I don't give away all my money to that church. And right. I got a BMW in the driveway and, you know, 3.4 children and, you know, and big house mm-hmm. and wherever. And. I seem to be doing pretty well. So, you know, not sure why we need all this God stuff. Because it could be gone in an instant. Well, sure, it could be, but it's not. And it won't be because because I've taken all the earthly precautions to prevent against that. Mm-hmm. I have insurance, and I have this, and I have that, and, mm-hmm. and I don't need God. See, you don't need God when you've got enough money. And that's really true, uh, is that people, that's, that's the way it works. Talk to the FTX guy who just lost his shirt on the Bitcoins. Oh, who? His name is Sam Bankman Freed. Yeah. Yeah. He just lost his billion dollars worth of, he just declared bankruptcy. Did the Bitcoins. Oh, what is he, the crypto guy? Yeah, crypto, crypto guy. Crypto. Yeah. Oh, did cryptocurrency drop or something? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. No. Well, he also owned the, the research it. group, which which was supposed to research it and everything, too. And he just donated to all the Democrats, too. Oh, good. Yes. Well, thankfully, you got okay. got that in first. Yes. Um, the, who was it? I was with somebody. Oh, uh, where was I? And he, he's we were talking 30 about, years of age. Yeah, talking about cryptocurrency, and, and it was a bunch of people my age. And I remember where I was now, probably after, oh, after lunch, maybe Sunday with friends. Uh, and uh, no, and not one of us could could explain. Oh, I don't, I don't know what it is. I can't explain it either. I don't know. What All it is. I know is it's some kind of fake cyber yeah. money, but yeah. I don't know any more about yeah. it than that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And if it sounds too good to be true, it is. Yeah. Yeah. That's what my brother, yeah. But now there's a new thing now where supposedly you know the argument was it's just imaginary money. It's not backed by anything. Well, now we'll back it by things. Okay. And so we'll we'll say this painting is worth a million dollars, and that's what backs up a million of these bitcoins. Except you're st- they don't what apparently I see, but no one else does, or they don't, is that you're just saying that painting's worth a million dollars. Yeah, <laughs> a painting is only worth what somebody it will pay for. Pay for it, right? Yeah. You know, it's like, well, my house is worth this much money. Well, yeah. not unless it sells so, for that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like with everything yeah. at your garage sale. It's yeah, like, yeah. But somebody's gonna pay. You. Yeah, right. So, yeah. Yeah. I love watching that uh, antique road show where people. Oh, yeah. I always enjoy. Now a lot of people say, "Oh, I just love it when someone finds out they have this million dollar piece." Yeah. I always like it when the people think they have a million dollar piece and find out it's worth a buck ninety. <laughs> That's what cracks me up. Oh. Um, what does it mean that the mountain of Yahweh will be higher than all the other mountains? The Zion, the the mountain of Yahweh, yeah. Zion. Is it kind of referring to heaven that it's up? Well, that is then, certainly certainly that. Yeah. yeah. I think also you got to think of who's Micah is talking to here. These people are uh, worshiping at multiple altars. Oh. Oh. Okay, because they're worshiping wherever they need to to make the buck. So if the temple of Baal, uh, if you're a, uh, a farmer and the temple of Baal buys uh, four or 500 bushels of grain from you every year uh, and expects you to show up uh, for worship once in a while, well, you know, you gotta do what you gotta do. Mm-hmm. You know? If your uh, child plays football <laughs> and they have uh, games on Sunday morning. Well, you're, if you're a good parent, you got to show up from time to time. Yeah. 
at least, right? Yeah. You can't just tell. You can't just pull your child out of football and say, no. "You can't play football <laughs> if it's on Sunday mornings." <laughs> can't do that. Right? Does this sound familiar? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nowadays yeah. it does. <laughs> A lot, not only that, but but then you have these people uh, today who think that, well, Muslims are people of faith, mm -hmm. Jews are people of faith, Christians are people of faith, Hindus are Christian people of faith. Why do we have to have these levels of my faith is better than your faith? Can't we all just be people of faith and get together and you know, we we can. I mean, I. I had a, a, a UCC pastor uh, tell me that I was being narrow-minded and uh, pig-headed and, I don't know, he had two or three other names for me, most of which are probably apical, uh, <laughs> but that because I refused to uh, be at a table with the uh, Islamic imam mm. and the Jewish rabbi with a bunch of pastors. Mm. I said, no, if, you're, if we're inviting the imam and the rabbi, then I'm not coming. Because I have nothing to, I have nothing in common with them. We worship different gods. <sighs> no, we all worship the same God. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, uh, insofar as there's only one God, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they claim th false things about him. Yeah. I mean, if if you were in a, uh, I don't know, some kind of social club, whatever you like, cards, garden, whatever, and one of the members of that club constantly spoke horrendous, nasty things about your parents. Just every time you got together, all they had to say was really nasty, rude, awful things about your parents. How long would you stay in that club? I'd never go back. No, I'd say until that person's gone, I'm, I'm not. Well, that's what, that's what Jews and Muslims do, is they speak nasty, rude, awful things about our God. Okay. Now we they they may not think they're being nasty and rude. That has, that that's of no uh, no point at all. Of course they don't think they're being nasty and rude, but they are. Mm -hmm. Therefore we don't engage with them. That's okay. Where we can say you're wrong. Right. Where we should say you're wrong. Yeah. Well, and, he, and if we do, then we're the wrong ones. See. Oh yes. Oh yeah. It's always yeah. stuck on back on us then. Yeah. Um. What's, what, what is attractive about the idea of just treating everybody, every person of faith is equal? Why is that attractive to people? Oh, it's kindness. We're getting mm -hmm. along. Yep. Uh, we don't uh, uh, discourage anyone from their own faith. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Everyone's going to heaven. Mm -hmm. um, we're not judgmental. Yeah, we're not judgmental. Oh, you're not allowed to be judgmental today. That's what I, yeah. That's what I, <laughs> ah, no <laughs> judging. Unless it's what they think. Yes. Well, yeah. Them. Well, then you're wrong. That's different. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Sarah says uh, uh, less confrontational. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, people oh, don't no. like confrontation. Oh, no. No. And I, I love to get into it. But yeah. I have to I know. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Oh, I'm going to listen. But you know, it's a good part. <laughs> yeah. So here's the question for you. How often does God call us to attractive things? God calls? Yeah, how often does, Satan when call. God calls us to do something, how often is it humanly attractive to us? Oh. Almost never. Yeah, yeah. Almost never. Yeah. yeah. So anytime it looks really good, be, care be careful. Yeah. Anytime something seems, oh man, this is, this is fantastic. This puts me in a great position. This is, I'm, this is, this is wonderful. Be careful because it may not be God. That's like, you know, you just said, if it's too good to be true, it is. Yeah. 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 Remember, yeah. remember the, uh, yeah. see you later. Remember the temptation of Christ. Yeah. All you have to do is worship me and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. And he would have. He wasn't lying. He would have made Jesus have the most fantastic life on this earth that anyone ever saw. Jesus would have been ruler of the earth. Yeah, it would have been great. No crucifixion for him. Royal robes and harems and good food and everything you could ever want. Uh, if you only had to do is worship him. And it's still true today. Yeah, I mean, if, if, you, will, if you will put your effort into non-Christian things. And I have, to be, I have to say that intentionally 
because people hear satanic and they think, well, I'm not, you know, doing seances in the woods, you know. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. So get that, get out, that out of your head. Satanic is not uh, just seances in the woods or whatever. Satanic is anything that is not Christian. So if you're not pursuing God, you're pursuing Satan. It's one or the other. Jesus says you can't have half and half. You know, either, either you pursue this or you pursue God. It's one or the other. You can't split your, your loyalties. People don't like that either. It's, it's, and a lot of times it's so easy to be on a path pursuing something else and then all of a sudden you realize, yeah. wait a second, but it's been all real nicey-nicey and it's like, wow. <laughs> Satan so, makes it attractive. Yeah. yeah. It's in that, that any, any time it's really attractive, be careful. You know, because, you know, he does that. And so, and it doesn't necessarily mean it's, it in, the, in and of itself is against God. Okay, I mean, let's say, um, I don't know, uh, a, a Caribbean, or no, a Viking river cruise in Europe for 15 days uh, is, what, fifteen twenty thousand dollars $20,000, something like that. You know, it's a two-week cruise, something like that. Uh, is there anything wrong about taking a Viking river cruise? No. Is there anything ungodly about it? No. But what if it means that you can't faithfully give to God because you have to pay this cruise bill? And here you go. You, 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 you're sitting out on the veranda having a glass of Pinot Grigio watching the, the uh, German you know, countryside go by and, and thinking, this is fantastic. You know, this is wonderful. Look how God has blessed me, you know. And all the time, Satan's standing there going, you know. And now, you know, when you get home, you're going to say, "Yeah, we can't really, we can't really give to the church right now. Where that that trip really, you know, really took our a toll on us." Uh, yeah, you, know, you got to understand. You no, know, he doesn't. You know, or or a, a, a better example maybe is uh, people I knew who uh, maintained a beautiful home. I mean, it would have made, any of, all three of our houses could have fit in their garage probably. Yeah. Uh, inspirational Bible quote. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. It says inspirational Bible quote. Less inspirational if you know who said it. <laughs> um, they, they uh, I mean, just a gorgeous home. Beautiful, sweeping staircases that go up from the foyer and all that. They also had another home in um, some place in the south. I don't remember where anymore now, Arizona or Florida or something like that. Um, they also uh, took phenomenal vacations to Europe every summer. Uh, their kids were all well educated in the best private schools. Uh, they were faithful in church every Sunday that they weren't in Europe or in their summer home or whatever. Uh, and uh, were very, very proud of themselves because they gave $200 a week to the church. And they let everybody know how proud of themselves they were for that. And I just stood there with blood running down my throat, you know, I mean, $200 a week, you should be giving $200 a day, you know, you have millions and millions of dollars and you're proud of yourself for giving $10,000 a year, you know, $10,000 a year. Now, if you told me, well, yeah, just 10,000 to this church and then 10,000 here and 10,000 there and 10,000, okay. You know, I mean, you don't have to give it all to one church, you know, uh, but but that I don't think that was the case. Mm -hmm. They were very enamored of themselves. He happened to be one of the officers of the congregation, and he liked to bring that up at congregational meetings that they give two hundred dollars a week to this church. Okay, <laughs> you know, and nobody would think that that was satanic. You know, they were wealthy people. They gave a good offering. I mean, ten thousand dollars a year is nothing to sneeze at. You know, that's a good offering. And every, you see what I mean by by it looking so nice. Mm 
Mm -hmm. I mean, so what if they have a beautiful home and a beautiful home and wherever it was and have beautiful vacations and all that, and they give a really good offering because they're not sacrificing. That's not a sacrificial offering. A sacrificial offering for them would be thousands of dollars a week. You know, that's a sacrifice. When you write that offering check, whether it's to this place or wherever you write it, it should hurt. If it doesn't hurt, then it's not enough. Yeah, if it, if you if you just if you write an offering check and it doesn't make any difference at all, then it's not enough. That's not what God says. God says first fruits, first fruits to me, whatever that is. And it's not a, He doesn't give us a numerical amount because He knows that's all we'd ever give. As <laughs> soon as we hit that, we okay, I'm done. I hit it. He don't. He won't even give us a percentage. Old Testament, they got a percentage. Uh, but remember that 10% was only one part of the tithe. The total tithe in the Old Testament was 33%. Yeah, you know, because it was gov because it was government and taxes. It was, a, it was a theocracy. So everything was combined. So the thank offering was 10%. But then there were all the other offerings when you added everything together came out to about 33%. Which seems about right, you know. That's about where your tax base is, you know. Um so yeah, so it's it's uh, but God in the New Testament he won't even give us a percentage. He says be faithful. You know, uh, you got uh, and then the great stories like Priscilla and Aquila, you know, who dropped dead because they they not because they didn't give enough, but because they lied about what they gave. They wanted to look good to the look what we gave. No, you didn't give it all. Oh, we sold our property. We gave it all to the church. No, you didn't. You're lying to the Holy Spirit. Boom. Drops dead. If we had a little bit of that once in a while, we'd have better stewardship. <laughs> That's right. New stewardship program. Uh, what is the purpose of the church? Or in Micah's case, because there was the church didn't exist yet, what is the purpose of God's people in the world? You know, th that's what we need to think about. It, before we think about, is this attractive? Is this easy? Is this hard? Is this sacrificial? Is this non-sacrificial? We ask ourselves, what is our purpose? Micah says, uh, later on, we'll, we'll come to this in chapter 6, he has told you, O man, what is good. Probably the most famous verse from Micah. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. You know, what is the purpose of the church? Um, it was... Uh, uh, I think September, I think it was, or October, no, September, uh, that I wrote an article for the newsletter that talked about the intersection of the Christian and politics. Because there is an intersection there that we need to be aware of. Uh, that when, when Micah talks about this, when Micah says, uh, what are you to do? To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. I mean, that is clearly something within the worldly kingdom you know that this is what god expects of us is to is to lead people but from our behavior in this kingdom and the primary way we have as american citizens of leading is through the vote that's the best way we can lead on a large scale uh, we i mean cuz no we can't none of us can walk into uh, springfield and say okay look let me show you how it's done <laughs> Because nobody cares. Uh, mm -hmm. None of us can walk into Washington, D.C. and say, here, step aside, President Biden. I'm going to show you what needs to be done here. No one cares. Uh, so what we can do as individuals on a large scale is vote. So, the, yes, we have a very clear calling as American citizens and as Christians to use our power of voting uh, and to vote for people who we believe are going to uh, further the kingdom of God. Okay, and and by furthering the kingdom of God, Micah defines it for us: uh, justice, uh, uh, love, kindness, humility. Those are the things that further the kingdom of God. Um, this was then and is now the purpose of God's people in the world. Okay, what uh, what say you to the following arguments? It won't do any good to proclaim the truth of God's word if there's no one to hear you do it. Meaning, you know, if you hammer too hard on the truth, people will just go elsewhere because they're made un they're made uncomfortable by a strict adherence to the truth. What do we say to that? 
Is it true? Yeah. Yeah. Churches that hammer too hard on the truth aren't the ones that are growing. They're not the big mega churches where everything's wonderful and they have lots of programs. I get those calls from time to time. Like, yes, do you offer a, uh, a couples counseling program? No. Uh, do you offer a, a grief seminar program? No. Do you offer uh, you know, child care for ages three to three and a half in their own special room? No. Yeah. <laughs> and I, sometimes I'll tell people like that, say, you know, I think what you're, you're trying to find the parks department. Yeah. This is not the parks department. This is Trinity Lutheran Church. What we offer here is the love of God and forgiveness for all your sins. That's what we offer here. And, and our goal here is not to be, as I said Sunday, that we are not a, uh, um, an activity center for retirees. That's not our goal. If our retirees like to get together and, and do stuff together, that's great. Fine. Wonderful. But that's not our goal. Our goal also is not to provide socialization for your children. Yeah, you know, we're not. This is not where Christian friends. You know, and I and I'm amazed at that. You know, I I I uh, will hear that complaint a lot from Lutherans because you know uh, the, the mega churches have a lot more young families and all. So I hear I've, over the years I've heard from Lutherans. Well, there's no kids here. My my kids' age. You know, I was raised in the church, and there was never any kids my age. I went through it. I never had the only kid I ever had in the church. It was my age with Janet Schumacher. And you know how much we had in common? <laughs> Nothing. I yeah. remember my own brother sitting there with me. <laughs> what, what I did have, what I did have was I had parents who you'll hear about. Uh, I'm going to talk about that this, in the sermon <laughs> Sunday. Uh, you know, parents who considered it important for me to hear the word of God. Uh, I, and, and, and considered it important for me to be related to a congregation of people who believed in the Word of God, and considered it important for me to be related to a pastor who considered it important to know the Word of God and to receive the sacraments. And I had all kinds of individualized attention growing up. I had, because I was you know, one of the few kids in the church. I didn't go to a church with, with tons and tons. Of, never did. All, all the churches we went to, I think out of all the churches I went to, because we moved around a lot, maybe one church had a lot of kids. And we were there for maybe a year or so. But all the other churches we went to had very few kids. And frankly, by the time I got to high school, I didn't like kids. <laughs> you know, and I wouldn't go to the, there was a youth group. Uh, it was not, not any of my friends. They were all from the other high school. And, uh, and I, I, had nothing, I didn't want to go to the, to the youth Bible study because I didn't like any of them. And my pastor came up to me and said, hey, you want to teach third grade Sunday school? I said, yeah, that'll get me out of Sunday school. And I don't have to hear my parents yell at me anymore. Because <laughs> they want their, their answer was, you either go to high school Bible study or you come to adult Bible study. You can do either one you want, but you're going to Bible study. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to go to the adult Bible study because I didn't want to be the only kid with a bunch of adults. <laughs> and I didn't want to go to the high school Bible study because I didn't like any of them. And I, didn't, you know, and I didn't like the teacher either. And, uh, and so you want to teach third grade Bible study? So I started teaching third grade Sunday school when I was 15 years old. You know, I didn't, it wasn't any kid my age. And yet somehow I learned, I, I became a, a socialized Christian, you know, just by being around adults who taught me about being Christian. You know, so this, this business of, of the church being some kind of uh, social agency is not the purpose of the church. You know, that's not what we're here for. Uh, the church should be a place that welcomes all people and makes them feel loved and accepted, not condemned for their sin. Well, except, well. <laughs> what are we going to say about sin? We all do it. <laughs> yeah. Are we going to pretend like it doesn't exist? Are, are we going to, to stop talking about it because it makes people uncomfortable? Again, I'm back to that old saying, you know, talk to my boss because he makes me uncomfortable too. You know, Don't tell me about it. Uh, the Bible has been, oh, we talked about that already in so many different ways. You know, how do you know your way is the only right way? Well, you know, go back to the Hebrew and Greek. And then you can't, you don't have the argument then. You know, you, and you're, if you do have an argument, it's so minute and so infinitesimal, you know, that it's, it's scholastic. You know, it doesn't matter. It's not a salvific issue. You don't have a salvific issue if you, if you are honest about the Hebrew and the Greek. 
Um, point is, these are all issues that we face today that were faced by Micah too. As people didn't like to hear about sin from Micah, they all wanted to be loved and accepted, just like all people want to be loved and accepted now. Uh, they, no one ever has ever liked the idea of a concrete word of God with no latitude. No one's ever liked that. You know, it's, it's not a good idea from a business perspective. You know, who would go into business saying, I'm going to offer this product and I'm going to make no changes in it whatsoever, no matter what the market says? You wouldn't last long, would you? No, you'd go out of business. It's, it is absolutely the, the, the greatest miracle of our time is that the church exists. Because all these years you've had an element of the true church on earth. Yeah, you have all the flaky stuff out there too. But you've always had an element of the true church saying, this is the word of God and we're not going to deviate from it. The fact that we exist is an absolute miracle of God. When, when he says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church, people, people say, say that sometimes speaking as in the future as though, they, well, it'll never prevail. It hasn't. Look at the past. It hasn't prevailed. There have been court actions. There have been persecutions. There have been, you know, we, we don't really see it in our lives so much, but people are killed for their faith in other countries, you know. And yet the church survives and even thrives in places particularly where there's more persecution. You know, the more persecution, the more the church thrives. The less persecution, the, the sloppier we get. That just that tends to be how it is. All right, we're going to stop there. We almost made it through chapter four. Um, <laughs> let's see. Stop there. Uh, next week, I am uh, going to teach... I know it's Thanksgiving week, right? Is that next week? Yes. Yeah, next week. Yeah. But I can. I'm still going to teach. So, okay. yeah. All right. Uh, we've missed too much earlier in the year, so because of my travel schedule. So I'm going to teach. So next eleven twenty two twenty two, uh, we're going to have Bible study. Okay. I don't think Pastor Allen's teaching on Wednesday though. So. And we have. Thanksgiving service on Wednesday Wednesday night, night 7 p.m. is Thanksgiving okay. service, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, let's close with the blessing. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. The Lord that his countenance upon us and give us peace. Amen. All right, see if I can turn this off now or see if I made it. Oh, look, it made it all the way through tonight. Good night. Oh.